so from their fiction titles and nonfiction books, the works of both Paul, Paul Marshall and John A. Williams have made readers aware of the importance of culture, memory, tradition, and politics in shaping the self and one's cultural identity in America and the Caribbean and abroad. Here to bring these two dynamic writers to, uh, of works to life are Lisa Jesse Peterson and Michael Anthony Green. Um, I'm going to uh, read their bios. Um, but first, before I introduce Lisa Jesse Peterson, I have to just share this moment um, with the, the, the audience and with Lisa. Um, Lisa is the sister of a very dear friend of mine who is no longer with us, gone too soon. But she was my friend, my colleague, my mentor. And every time I see Lisa and all the incredible work that she's doing, I know that Leslie is looking down on you and just smiling with so much pride. I love you. Um, so that's my fangirl moment. <laughs> um, but beyond that, Lisa Jesse Peterson is an activist, an actress, playwright, author, and poet. Her critically acclaimed one woman show, The Peculiar Patriot, premiered at the National Black Theater in Harlem, was nominated for a Drama Desk Award and received a generous grant from the Agnes Gunn Prison um, Prestigious Art for Justice Fund. Lisa performed The Peculiar Patriot in more than 35 penitentiaries across the country. She's the author of All Day, A Year of Love and Survival Teaching Incarcerated Kids at Rikers Island. Hachette Publishing 2017, and was featured in Ava DuVernay's 13th. Welcome, Lisa. And we have also, Lisa will be reading from um, Paulie Marshall's The Fisher King. We also have with us Michael Anthony Green. He is the producer, director of Shades of Truth Theater for the past 16 years and has received critical praise for his ongoing portrayal of Dr. King and Jeff Steston's The Meeting at, Sch at the Schomburg Center, national and tri-state area venues. Outstanding credits include Armand's Savior, Blues for an Alabama Sky, A Lesson Before Dying, The Blacks, <laughs> Blue Train, and Camp, Lo Camp Logan. He has written and produced Whistle in Mississippi, The Lynching of Emmett Till, MLK, If He Had Sneezed, and Barbara Jordan, I Dare to Be Me, in collaboration with Basel Rivers, New Heritage Theater Group. Michael today will be reading um, from the novel, The Man Who Cried, I Am. We will begin with our dramatic presentation this afternoon with Lisa Jesse Peterson. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a beautiful introduction and I'm so grateful and honored to be here. Um, I am gonna be reading from an excerpt from the first chapter of Polly Marshall's The Fisher King. Um, and because I'm reading an excerpt, I want to give the audience context of where I'm jumping in, um, the point of where I'm jumping in um, to the text. So the context is Sonny, the eight-year-old grandson of the jazz pianist Sonny Rhett Payne, is brought from Paris to his Brooklyn neighborhood. And he meets his great-grandmother, Mrs. Payne. When he is left alone with his great-grandmother, she tells him to come into the house. What he experiences is life-changing. So this is the excerpt from chapter one. Inside, fearful but curious, he followed her down a long dim hallway that wasn't much warmer than outside and that had a smell. The basement or ground floor of the woman's house had a dank, musty, stale kitchen smell and there was so little light for all his curiosity he couldn't see much of anything except shadows large unwelcoming shadows observing him on either side he kept close on the woman's heels as if to make up 
for the time lost waiting for Hattie to leave, she was moving at a stiff but urgent shuffle. Midway down the hall, a walled-in staircase loomed up to their right and without bothering to check on him behind her, she started up the steps. She climbed one halting baby step at a time while he hung back at the bottom, unable to see where to place his foot. The darkness on the walled-in stairs was so dense. Come along now. He scrambled up blindly, yelling at him. Annoyed, he would have sneaked a look under her dress to get back at her had there been any light. It was wrong, but he would have done it anyway. Upstairs on the second floor, another long hall led back toward the front of the house. There was somewhat more light here, although it only served to reveal a shameful state of neglect and dirt everywhere, cracked and peeling walls, large turds of dust like tumbleweed. Overhead, the rusted pipes of a defunct sprinkler system lined what had once been a beautiful coffered ceiling. Underfoot, the filthy hall runner was worn clear through to the floorboards down its center. He would tell Hattie on her that she had yelled at him and that she kept her house no better than she kept herself. Near the front of the hall, she came to a halt at the foot of a wide staircase leading to the two upper floors of the house. Then abruptly, turn off the lights and that blasted radio up there. The woman suddenly shouting like a drill sergeant up the dark and silent stairs. You think I own Con Edison? Damn rumors, use more trouble than profit. Before he could see the lights or hear the radios for himself, he was bounding after her over to an elaborately carved double door on their left. As was true of all the woodwork in the hall, the joined doors had clearly not been polished in years. Nevertheless, they were still handsome, stately, tall, reaching almost to the high ceiling the kind of doors he'd only seen in a church. These the woman opened, or rather, she made them disappear with what seemed to him an abracadabra motion of her hands, including the shaky one. On the handles, she sent both halves of the great door rumbling out of sight. Magic, true. He saw the metal track in the floor and the long slender pockets in either wall yet it nonetheless seemed like something magical she had, she had done. He was suddenly less annoyed with her. Through the wide doorway, the old woman ushered Sonny into a shuttered, airless living room filled to overflow with an assortment of shabby, mismatched furniture, none of it arranged in any order. A living room that had originally been a formal Victorian front parlor although now it looked like a dark, dusty warehouse or a secondhand furniture store that hadn't had a sale in years. Moving with even greater urgency, she led him through the clutter over to an old upright piano that had an unusually high front. Out of everything in the room, the piano alone stood dusted and polished. There she stopped. Take off your coat now. His new coat. Hattie had bought it for him only days ago with the money from the check sent her by the man who had met them at the airport. After threatening for weeks to tear up both the checks and the letter that had accompanied it and tossed the pieces like so much Hubel garbage in the scene, she had finally changed her mind and used the money to outfit him in everything new from head to toe. No need for you to go there looking like a pauper, she said. He handed over the coat as well as his hat and gloves to the woman who then pointed to his shoes, also new. He was to remove them too. Why? He started to ask only to see her stiffen, about to yell at him again. He did as ordered. The shoes off. She waved him up on the piano bench. He was not to sit though. Another wave directed him to stand. 
And when he did, when he stood up on the bench in his socks, he found himself face to face on top of the piano with a large framed photograph of a boy, more or less his age, a primely posed, unsmiling boy, a lesser shade of brownish black than himself and all dressed up in an old timey suit and high top shoes, his hair neatly parted on one side, his hands neatly clasped in his lap. The boy in the photograph appeared to be seated at the same piano, his back to it, and on the stand behind lay a music book. Through the sepia cast of the picture, a large B could be seen on the music book's cover, following by, followed by an A, a C, and ending with H. <clears throat> the woman stood quietly, almost reverently, examining the photograph with him until all of a sudden, without warning, she swung angrily away from it and was shouting again, this time up at the cobweb ceiling. Had the brass face to come round me playing the Sodom and Gomorrah music. Then her voice normal again. Sit, she said. He quickly dropped down on the bench as she uncovered the keyboard. I don't know how to play, he said. She ignored this, reaching around him from behind, open the pan from behind, open the panels in the piano's high front. To his astonishment, there inside the piano, in its innards, stood a long roll of white paper, paper whiter and cleaner than anything he had seen so far in the house. Instead of the usual cat's cradle of strings and little felt tip hammers that even he knew was what made the music when you struck the keys. There was something that looked like a giant roll of papier hygienique. What was toilet paper doing inside a piano? All the more puzzling, someone had taken a razor blade and made any number of little cuts and nicks all over it. Before he could find his tongue more tragic, the giant roll of white paper began to move. The woman pressed a switch to the left of the keyboard and the paper began moving. In the same instant, keys to the left and right of where he sat, the yellowed ivory ones, as, as well as the faded black keys began moving at random, sinking down and then rising rapidly, sinking and rising entirely on their own. And the music, Music as tall and stately and ecclesiastic as the doors the woman had made vanish came pouring forth. Sonny looked up at her dumbstruck and she touched him, bending over him, enveloping him in what Hattie would have called a B.O. smell mixed together with the damp mustiness of her basement. She took his hands and both of hers. The woman's fluttering, left hand closed around his, the feel of it. Scared, repelled, he tried pulling away. Hold still! Maintaining her grip, she then did two things that in the next few minutes would make him forget for the time being the scary feeling of her hand. First, she slowly spread his fingers and arched them slightly. This done, she then began guiding his hands to where the keys left and right were sinking down, trying to reach them and place his fingers on as many of them as possible in the fraction of a second before they rose again. For the longest time, she repeatedly steered his, hand back, his hands back and forth across the keyboard, showing him how the game was played while the huge sheet of paper with the hieroglyphics of cuts and nicks scrolled majestically down before his eyes and the music soared. Finally, she released his hands, stood up from over him and said, all right now, you to play till I say stop and went and sat down nearby. He was suddenly on his own at first, he missed all the keys. They will fall and rise before he even came close. He wasn't fast enough, alert enough, and his fingers were too short. 
It was a frustrating scramble that made him want to bring his fist like a sledgehammer down on the keyboard or, or throw himself on the floor and kick him, kick him rage as if it were as if he were a baby again. Until gradually, ever so slowly, as he kept at it, his eyes grew more alert to the slightest movement on either side of him, and his fingers became faster in tracking his eyes to the spot. Eventually, he was reaching some of the keys just as they began to descend and pressing them down completely. He was the one causing them to sink before they quickly rose again. It was all his doing. So that while it remained a game, he convinced himself that he was actually playing. He, Sonny Carmichael Payne, was the one creating the lofty music and not just some oversized bowl of papier, papier hygienique. <laughs> As for the keys he missed, which was most of them, he was enjoying himself too much to care. What did the woman think of his play? He paused to look over at her. She was seated in a sagging, overstuffed armchair that looked as if a generation of feral cats had used its padded legs as scratching posts, the upholstery in shreds. Under her hat, which she hadn't taken off, nor had she removed the sweater that was as heavy as a coat, her eyes were closed. Had she nodded off? Patty did that sometimes. He caught, though, the hint of a smile. The forbidding woman smiling, her right hand clamped down hard on its, on its ungovernable twin to keep it quiet in her lap. She was listening to the music with what he could swear was the trace of a smile on her aged, fallen face. That's the excerpt from the Fisher King. Thank you so much. We're having our virtual clap, clap, clap. Thank you so very much. Um, so Lisa's gonna stay around because we'll have um, an opportunity to talk with her a little bit later. But now we want to bring to this virtual stage producer and director, Michael Anthony Green, who is going to be reading an excerpt from um, John A. Williams. The man who cried. The story centers around the central character, Max Reddick, a novelist. And we catch up with him at a point of his career where he is a has a brief stint working in the current White House administration as a correspondent slash liaison to the community. The president seemed preoccupied when Max entered his office. The room was bright and quiet, but it felt charged with tension. Come on in, Max. Ah, what a day. What do you suggest we do to overtake the Russians? Drink more vodka, Mr. President? Well, maybe we've had too much already. You know, Every hour we have to judge things on their merits and handle those with the most importance to our people. Now, some things must be first and others have to follow. We'd like to be able to handle all the important things at once and handle them well, but we can't. Now, in my judgment, civil rights at the moment does not come first. In fact, there's a bill going to Congress next month without my endorsement. Because I believe the executive office has recourse to laws already in existence to alleviate the inequities in our society. That picture could change tomorrow or tonight. Uh, I think you disagree with me. But that's what I want you to do. We don't need any yes-men around here. We haven't asked any to join us. And I want you to behave as though the civil rights is our most urgent problem. Now, in that light, I, I want you to write what you think about it. I want memos from you every week. 
I want the closest possible cooperation between you, Jim, and Gus. You are me in this instance, sir, with all the checks and balances that are bound to the office of president, with the impetus or drag of public opinion included. Now, since the leaders of the movement, I want well, you to talk to them. I want to know every change in their thinking. If something comes up that's urgent, call Mrs. Agner, and she'll get you back in here so we can talk about it. That's all, Max. Max retreated to a small office, determined to work until he was needed. The city became a Hollywood setting. The president was the superstar, and everyone shared or added to the rumors about him. They joked about it, but to a man or woman, they defended him. If the rumors are true, well, then they'd rather have a swinging president than a swung one. The senators, representatives, committee chairmen, and agency officials were cameo stars in the daily productions. The women who emerged with the approach of dust from the government buildings, eager for the nights in which they sought husbands, love, or just plain company, were extras who often stole scenes from the stars. Washington could have killed any Superman if he'd been a Negro. As Jim Bonner had suggested, with each passing week, new Negro faces appeared in Washington, and because racial barriers were coming down with the crash, the Negroes were expected to attend functions regularly. Then there were the Negro functions as well, and if you liked white company, enough to miss a number of the latter, you were placed in limbo. Max saw many a man crumble before the onslaught of martinis, Pussy by the Yard, and Black Tie Affairs. Theodore Dallas confessed to Max soon after he was moved to the U.S. mission to the U.N. that he could not have pulled another three months in Washington and lived. One week after the president had categorically denied the possibility of an invasion of Cuba in which American armed forces would participate, the premier of Cuba announced that the rebel forces which had invaded his island, with American help, had been crushed. Max, when is the president going to do something? They all asked him the same question. And Max was torn between his loyalty to them and loyalty to the president. The question was asked more often and in desperation in the next month, when the Freedom Ride South began. The press secretary announced that the president had refused to endorse the series of civil rights bills with provisions to speed desegregation and make the Civil Rights Commission a permanent body. Because the president did not think it necessary to enact civil rights legislation at the moment. Max sat in his office waiting. When the news came that two of the Freedom Riders Buses had been burned near Anniston, Alabama. Six days later, when rioting broke out in Montgomery after the Freedom Riders were attacked again, federal marshals were sent to restore order. Gus Carrigan summoned Max to his office in the east wing. In the east wing. What's going on, Max? You mean in Alabama? Yes, 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 of course. I suppose it's... A reaction to the president not endorsing the civil rights package that went up. You can't be serious. Why not? But there's already a series of laws providing for interstate travel without restrictions. Well, obviously no one's bothered to enforce those laws. I mean, Gus, can't you see what's happening? If the president is relying on laws already on the books, these tactics, and they are tactics, are designed to prove to him that they are no good unless enforced by the federal government or unless new legislation is introduced and passed. That's what's going on. The governor has asked for more help. 200 more marshals are going in tomorrow. And the president says he wants this thing settled before he goes to Paris. Am I supposed to tell the leaders this? Max, I, I wish you wouldn't be quite so, uh, so truculent. Where do your loyalties lie? 
with just the Negroes, but to the country. I have been trying to tell you what's good for the country. What histories do you read, Gus? Tell me about the history of the American Armed Forces, and I can show you how important Negroes were to those forces. Tell me about the history of the American economics, and I can show you where Negroes made up the bulk of those economics by being poor or left out of them altogether. Tell me about the history of religion in America, and I can show you where as long as there's been Negroes in this hemisphere, religion has been an absolute lie. Tell me about the history of American politics, and I can show you where American politics would be vastly different today if Negroes had had a real voice in them. Damn it, Gus. It's you who have vested loyalties. If I went out there and told these leaders, and I'm not, because I'm not going to be an errand boy for you or the president. If I told them to stop, because the president says so, forget about Alabama, forget about Georgia, New York, you name it, forget about it. Man, why don't you people use me? I mean, all my life I fought like hell to keep people from using me. I came down here for you to, to use me, and you won't. Have patience, Max. Patience. We know you set aside a lot of, a lot to come down here. You, you, you got to trust us. The whole machinery has got to move, not just one part of it. Yeah. Max stood. Gus, I'm sorry. I guess we'll mesh. I want you to give a little. But I and my people have always been the ones to give. And I'm trying to tell you, and I'm serious, that they are tired of giving. Now, whatever I do, I mean, that's, that's it. That's all. That's the nut of my counsel. Kerrigan nodded. That's a good idea. Max tracked McKendrick to New York where he had gone to give a series of lectures under the auspices of the new Pan-African movement. They arranged to meet at Max's apartment. McKendrick was a small man, and like so many Negroes, had a mixture of white and Indian blood flowing beneath his heavily bronzed skin. His voice was soft. Sorry, I'm And his sure. accent was filled with highs and lows. Mr. McKendrick, I'd like to find out what happened in Mississippi. I noticed tonight at your rally you directly accused the president of interfering with your attempts to get into the university. McKendrick was a, was a bit old for a freshman, about 21, working and studying to overcome the inadequate teachings in the Negro high school he had gone to and trying to get up a little cash to hold himself together the first semester. Now that was all shot. He waved aside the drink Max offered him. Uh, Mr. Reddick, they tell me you work for the president. McKendrick's smooth face broke into a smile. You're one of those big colored gentlemen that don't have anything to worry about. That's right, I, I work for the president. But what you tell me may just determine for how much longer. Well, whose future are we going to talk about? Yours or mine? Both our futures, Mr. McKendrick. Well, Mr. Reddick, I hate to disillusion you about our head of state, but I was asked by a man from the U.S. Attorney General's office not to enter the university because the administration was afraid my move did not fit its timetable for attacks against the desegregation holdouts. I was told that it would be embarrassing for such a conflict to come up so early in the president's time in the White House. This man made me a promise. If I held out until next year, they'd see me into the university, whatever it required. Now, Mr. Reddick, I'm a little man, just an ordinary citizen, and maybe not even that because I'm black. 
but I spent a lot of time studying after my graduation to be able to enter the university without scholastic difficulty. And I had to earn some money so I wouldn't look as poor as I am. But I'm intelligent enough to know that we do have some laws on the books that say I can go to any school I wish. I told that man if the government wasn't ready, I was. And he went away. It's taken me two years to get six names of old Miss alumni. That's what the university requires. Oh, I found them, reconstructed, living outside the South. But the Attorney General also found them, with a hell of a lot less trouble. They were asked to withdraw their names as references, and five agreed. I withdrew because I couldn't get five new names in time for the start of the summer semester. You can prove this, of course. He watched the youth as he opened his attache case and brought out copies of letters each of the five references had sent him. These are copies. Can I have them? They're yours, sir. I'm going to try for the fall semester without the references. I wanted to do it their way, but that didn't work out. Now I have to do it my way. You'll be in a lot of danger, you know. If you're black, you're always in danger. More danger when you place some faith in administration that double crosses you. The golden age, Max thought later, had not yet arrived. The administration could easily deny McKendrick's charges. And a terse denial meant to the careful, clever newsman at the presidential press conferences that he wasn't supposed to ask questions. If he did, his hand would probably never be recognized by the president and the name played on the back of his chair as good as removed. Max believed that the administration people did not think themselves ready for the desegregation battle, but millions of people were going to ask, when would they be ready? When Max returned to Washington, Carrigan asked. What did he have to say? His grades, they tell us, were completely shot, said Bonnard. His grades were all right, Max said. My, inform my information is that the Attorney General did indeed ask his references to withdraw, and five of them did. Carrigan toyed with the pencil. Max, he said. It's true. Ah, uh, we did learn about McKendrick. His grades from Mississippi were all right. But we didn't want to run the risk of a confrontation with the governor and then have this kid flunk out of school. <laughs> Why is it that no one seems to mind that once a Negro decides to buck the society, he forfeits the right to fail? Because it's more than one person, one Negro. If we're to help the mass, the people we help have got to be, and consistently so, winners. Then you, you knew all along. I don't have to let you see the copies of the letters McKendry gave me. Neither Carrigan nor Bonnard spoke. The facts spoke for themselves. The administration deliberately and successfully subverted the lawful attempt of a citizen to enroll in an educational institution of his choice, a constitutional violation by the people entrusted to uphold the Constitution. Max said, gentlemen, you place me in a most awkward position. You have no confidence in me and I have none in you. You can't imagine how sorry I am. Come on, Max, Bonnard said. We can straighten this all out. Yeah, yeah, yes, we made a mistake, a real boo, said Carrigan. We're bound to make mistakes in this business. Human error. He plans to enter for the fall semester. Without the references. Now, if people lose playing according to the rules, you got to expect them to ignore the rules after a while. Do you know what's going to happen to him? He'll go it alone. They'll let him in. If they let him in, one of those Mississippi moles will kill him. On the other hand, maybe as soon as he registers, the sheriff will arrest him, throw him in jail or into the crazy house. Could be that they'll hang him and say he committed suicide. 
You know the stories, or don't you? Max, black Americans know the stories. All of them. It's been a bad time. Cuba. Russia's in space. Now this. We've made mistakes. We've underestimated people. But our efforts have been honest and history can't condemn us. I know the president is sincere in wanting to keep his promises to American Negroes. But he, he's got almost a complete term left. And when he makes his move, he wants to lock it up, not lose. You know, that sometimes the individual has got to be sacrificed for the group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I just want to thank um, our two performance performers this afternoon, Lisa Jesse Peterson um, and Michael. Um, what you have done today is no easy feat bringing to life the work the words of someone else. Um, so I thank you so very much, Michael Green and Lisa Jesse Peterson. Um, of course, um, for all of our attendees who are here today, I just want to remind you that if you're enjoying the program, which I totally hope that you are, um, the best way to support our artists um, is to purchase their books. So please, while we get ready to go on break, um, visit AALBC.com to view the selection of books that are available by all of our participants who are here today. Um, and in addition to that, we can't do what we do without your support. So hopefully, um, no donation is too small. And of course, as Wallace said earlier, no donation is too big either. Um, so please consider making a tax deductible donation um, by visiting the centerforblackliterature.org so that we will be able to have programs like this in the future. Um, thank you so very much. We are going to take a short